Welcome back to our discussion of muscles in chapter 11 in our current textbook for biology 2210 at CNM. Last time we left off at objective 161. We have already talked about the various uh, energy sources that skeletal muscles use uh, during contraction. And we finished last time by talking about something called oxygen debt, this uh, oxygen that has to be repaid following exercise uh, to do various things like regenerate stored ATP, regenerate creatine, phosphate, reoxygenate, myoglobin, etc. And so we said this, this is why we don't stop breathing heavily and our heart rate doesn't drop immediately following exercise, uh, we have to continue to take in excess oxygen and distribute it. This is known as post-exercise oxygen consumption. And this is what pays off oxygen debt. And it can take anywhere from a few minutes to hours to repay the oxygen debt. So that's where we left off last time. So we're ready to start today with objective 162, where we start talking about different classes of skeletal muscle fibers. Um, the point here is that not all skeletal muscle fibers are created equal. Uh, some of them have different properties that, uh, that allow them to be suited for different kinds of activities. Um, there are, in the animal world, in the mammal world, there are three types of muscle fibers, three classes, but in humans there's largely just two. And these two physiological classes are referred to as fast um, glycolytic fibers and slow oxidative fibers. Fast glycolytic and slow oxidative fibers. There are some other names for these uh, kinds of fibers. Fast glycolytic fibers are also known as fast twitch muscle fibers or white fibers for reasons we'll see. And the slow oxidative fibers are also known as red fibers or slow twitch muscle fibers. And there's even uh, one scenario in which they're referred to as type 1 and type 2 fibers. But I'm going to use the words fast glycolytic and slow oxidative fibers to, to describe these. Essentially, um, just summarizing the difference between the two, fast glycolytic fibers are tend to be the kinds of muscles that are good for quick, short-term, powerful contractions, just short bursts of powerful muscle contraction. Um, perhaps the one of the best ways to visualize the difference here is to think of a chicken. And we all know when you um, eat chicken, there's what we call light meat and dark meat. Well, light meat and dark meat is uh, the difference between fast twitch and slow twitch fibers. Uh, white meat is the um, fast glycolytic fibers, the white fibers, and the dark meat on a chicken is uh, the slow oxidative or red fibers, giving it its darker color. If you think about chickens, and their lifestyle, uh, they use the the fast glycolytic fibers, the white fibers, uh, as um, as breast muscles, chest muscles, it's breast meat. What they use these muscles for is for flying. Whereas the dark meat tends to be things like the thigh and the drumstick, the legs, which they use for walking and running. And if you know anything about chickens, if you scare up a chicken. Uh, and cause it to fly, it takes off with a tremendous burst of energy. It can be very startling if you're not used to it, the amount of power and the, the fuss and feathers flying all over the place because they take off so powerfully. That's because they use white meat or, again, fast glycolytic fibers to, to fly. Uh, so very powerful bursts of activity. But what you notice about chickens is they can't fly for very long. Uh, because again, the white meat, the breast meat, is only good for short-term bursts of powerful contraction. And so they'll fly for a short distance, but then they, they land pretty quickly. On the other hand, if you chase a chicken and it's not particularly alarmed, and it chooses to run away from you instead of fly, uh, 
uh, you can spend a lot of time chasing after a chicken because uh, they can run and move uh, seemingly forever. They can just go and go and go in terms of running and, and walking. Um, and again, that's because the muscles that make up their legs, the dark meat, those are slow twitch um, oxidative fibers, which uh, are better suited for long term, but less powerful kinds of contractions. Um, and so that, in a nutshell, is the difference between these so-called fast glycolytic fibers and slow oxidative fibers. Again, fast glycolytic, good for short-term powerful contractions, but they fatigue quickly for reasons we'll see. Slow oxidative fibers um, tend to be good for long-term kinds of endurance activities, and they, of course, tend to be uh, resistant to fatigue. All right, so what are the differences between uh, these two types of fibers? Well, let's start by looking at the characteristics of the slow oxidative fibers. The, this is red meat, uh, to use the chicken uh, example. And as we said, well, they're well adapted for endurance. They re resist fatigue because their metabolism is primarily aerobic, meaning, again, they use oxygen. They produce lots of uh, ATP from glucose and fatty acids. They don't produce lactic acid and, and uh, the metabolic waste products tend to be carbon dioxide and water. Well, water is not a waste product that uh, causes fatigue in muscles. It's actually a useful waste product. And the carbon dioxide we know is ferried away by the blood to the lungs. So you don't have really the buildup with aerobic respiration of any kinds of uh, problems that will quickly cause muscle fatigue. And so we tend to find these endurance type muscles, these slow oxidative fibers in places where it's important to maintain long-term contraction, not so important for strong bursts of activity. So notice we see that they're very important as postural muscles, uh, the muscles of the back, uh, some of the muscles in the legs and so on uh, that maintain posture. In terms of their f uh, physical characteristics, it's pretty predictable. Since they're aerobic and require oxygen, um, they have lots of capillaries supplying them with oxygen from the blood. This is what gives them their red color. The red comes from the abundance of capillaries carrying blood into these muscles. Uh, they have lots of mitochondria. Of course, mitochondria are the sites of aerobic respiration, so that's that makes sense. And they have a high amount of myoglobin, again, that storage molecule that, that maintains a reservoir of oxygen. Myoglobin, like hemoglobin, tends to turn red when it's bound to oxygen, and it also contributes to the reddish color, the dark color of these fibers. Um, because they're not important in terms of fast responses, the kind of uh, myosin they have and the kinds of enzymes they have are relatively slow ATP aces and other kinases and so the contraction the twitch uh, duration is relatively slow uh, it's, it's still less than a second of course still measured in milliseconds but a relatively slow twitch compared to the fast glycolytic fibers um, the fibers are relatively thin the individual cells are relatively thin because again power is not primarily what we're after here, we're after endurance. And they tend to be grouped in small motor units, uh, which gives us, remember, fine control over the movements. Again, we're not interested in powerful bursts, so we don't necessarily need uh, a lot of large motor units in this kind of muscle. We're more interested in, in precise movements and fine control, so we see smaller motor units. When we take a look at fast glycolytic fibers, the white meat of chicken, um, for instance, we see that things are uh, essentially exactly the opposite. So uh, again, these are fibers that are adapted for quick responses um, and important in very powerful kinds of movements. So if you need either speed or um, power, you're going to use these fast twitch glycolytic fibers. They are 
um, primarily anaerobic in their metabolism. They're primarily anaerobic in their metabolism, and so they rely chiefly on glycolysis for their source of energy, which makes them relatively inefficient. Um, so what that means is that they have lots of glycogen as their reservoir for glucose, and they have lots of creatine phosphate to fuel the phosphagen system to keep that glycolysis going. They do not have a lot of myoglobin, and they do not have uh, as many capillary beds in the muscle tissue. And so, of course, they don't have that reddish color. Instead, they tend to be very pale in appearance. They also do not have as many mitochondria as you would see in the slow oxidative fibers. In terms of their myosin, their myosins are equipped with faster enzymes for faster muscle twitches, and they release calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum more quickly than do the slow oxidative fibers. Because power is usually um, of interest in, this, in these muscles, the fibers tend to be thicker in diameter than the slow oxidative fibers, which makes them stronger. And finally, they tend to be grouped into larger motor units rather than smaller ones because, once again, we're not really interested here in precise contractions. We're more interested in generation of, again, fast bursts of power. So all the features of the fast glycolytic fibers correlate well with their particular function of quick and powerful contractions. And the same can be said for the slow oxidative fibers, very well designed for slower but more endurance type contractions. As I said, there is such a thing as a third fiber type called fast twitch um, oxidative fibers also known as intermediate fibers. Uh, but again, these are, these are fairly rare in humans. You don't see them very much, but they're kind of intermediate between the two classes. They twitch quickly, uh, but are endurance uh, type, uh, adapted for endurance type activities. But again, not, not too much in humans. Um, remember, there are some other things as well that can affect the strength of a muscle. Temporal summation, wave summation, uh, where we put a muscle into complete tetany will also slightly increase the force of contraction as we saw. And again, that's pretty much under conscious control uh, when, we do, when we're working out anyway. Remember, the length of a muscle will affect its, the force of its contraction. That was called the length tension relationship. And again, there's not much we can do about this. Uh, the muscle simply gets weaker or stronger depending on where you are as you go through an exercise and its particular range of motion. Uh, let's not, even though it's not listed here, let's not forget about trepi. Warming up will affect uh, a muscle's strength. The warmer it is, the, the uh, stronger it gets, at least initially. And that We talked about that was the benefit of warming up uh, as you begin exercising. And then, of course, finally, fatigued. fatigue will affect the force of muscle contraction as well. And so, again, if you look at all these factors that affect muscle contraction, really the only things that we can really influence uh, very much are the two types of summation, which we do consciously, and then the, the increase in muscle size, which happens over time if we continue our exercise program. And as I said earlier, resistance training simply means contracting muscles against a load that resists the movement of the muscle, right? Weightlifting. Um, and again, as I said earlier, this, this resistance is what stimulates the growth uh, in the muscle fibers. As I've mentioned earlier uh, in a previous video, in uh, resistance training really doesn't necessarily involve any aerobic uh, activity because you can lift weights and, and in the traditional way of lifting weights you know 30 40 years ago um, it was just short bursts of activity separated by long periods of rest in between and so that kind of weight lifting really only engages the anaerobic uh, mechanisms and it really doesn't contribute at all to aerobic conditioning or increasing endurance of muscles 
it does increase the size of muscles and it does increase their strength so you can become very powerful but um, the power is pretty short term it's only for short bursts of activity and as you might guess people that tend to gravitate or in the old days uh, before we appreciated cross training people that tended to gravitate towards that kind of activity would have been people who had a large uh, percent of fast glycolytic fibers because that is what's well suited for that kind of activity endurance training on the other hand is seeking to improve uh, not the force necessarily of the muscle contraction but the endurance of the muscles um, and so endurance training is of course where you challenge uh, yourself to continue muscle contraction for longer periods of time in the old days again this, these used to be called aerobics classes um, these days you don't see that too much anymore because we're trying to get away from an either or kind of exercise and we're trying to accomplish both increase in muscle strength and endurance at the same time and that really is the philosophy behind cross training and hit high intensity interval training and other other kinds of modern exercise programs um, but in endurance training of course that is geared more towards the slow oxidative fibers and what we do there is again we just try to increase the size and uh, activity of specifically the slow twitch fibers and gain more of that kind of muscle contraction I will also point out that endurance training doesn't just work on the muscles. Uh, endurance training also changes other parts of our body to promote endurance activities. So what else has to be um, altered to get endurance activity in addition to just the muscle? Well, um, your cardiovascular system has to also increase in its efficiency so the heart becomes stronger. Um, the ability to pump blood through blood vessels uh, improves it, you may even actually grow more blood vessels to serve your muscles as a result of endurance training that's an extreme response but it does happen uh, the blood vessels themselves become healthier in terms of their uh, smooth muscle uh, uh, in their in the walls and how that smooth muscle can cause constriction and dilation the respiratory system also has to improve in its function and so you you begin to um, develop greater what we call volumes and capacities in the respiratory system so the amount of air that your lungs can hold and the efficiency with which your muscles contract to pull air in and push air out of the lungs increases uh, the efficiency with which gas exchange takes place between uh, air sacs in the lungs and your blood increases um, all of these things uh, benefit and respond to endurance training so you not only improve the function of the slow twitch fibers but you also improve the function of these other systems as well and that combines to give you your endurance capacity and again this is uh, this is the benefit of cross training uh, again in the old days it, it, it used to be one or the other. You either had these big powerful people that did weightlifting but couldn't run, you know, 200 yards. And then you had these sort of skinny, uh, not very muscular endurance type individuals that could do aerobics classes for seemingly hours at a time but had also seemingly no muscle mass. And at some point, we realized that it didn't need to be an either or situation. And you can train. Uh, to promote both kinds of um, responses and that's pretty much how we train today though there are still some people who uh, fit the old dichotomy um, uh, some people that think if they do endurance training they're going to lose all their muscle mass and some people that think that if they're if they lift weights they're going to become overly muscular um, and again both both perspectives are probably a little uh, unrealistic um, and I think for the for the most part most of us appreciate that cross training is the is the way to go all right so that completes our discussion of skeletal muscles which as we said earlier is the the main topic in this chapter 11 
Um, but we do want to finish up with a discussion of cardiac and smooth muscle. We're not going to talk about them in nearly the detail that we talked about skeletal muscle, but we do want to at least take a look because there are some interesting differences in how cardiac and smooth muscle contract compared to skeletal muscle. So remember from our uh, basic discussion of muscle tissue previously, uh, cardiac and smooth muscle are both involuntary types of muscle. We do not have any ability to control them at a conscious level. The cells of cardiac and smooth muscles are referred to as myocytes. So with skeletal muscles, remember we call those cells uh, muscle fibers. Uh, here though, we use the term myocyte to refer to the cells. And another difference is where they receive their signals, from where they receive their signals. Remember, um, skeletal muscle cells receive their excitation or signals from motor neurons of, uh, called somatic motor neurons that are um, devoted to vol usually voluntary type signals. Cardiac and smooth muscle, however, however, receive their signals from something called the autonomic nervous system. And the again, to refresh your memory, the autonomic nervous system is the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. And there are some differences between autonomic innervation and somatic innervation, which we'll take a quick look at here in a few minutes. Just to refresh your memory, cardiac muscle tissue looks like this under the microscopes. Um, you see under the microscope, you see intercalated discs primarily, uh, these darker lines that represent gap junctions, specialized connections between neighboring cardiac cells. Also remember that they are slightly striated with um, a single nucleus per cell, not multinucleate like skeletal muscle cells. And they all are also bifurcate, which means they tend to be Y-shaped. Another picture of cardiac muscle tissue showing the intercalated discs perhaps a little better. And here we see just some, some characteristic features of cardiac muscle tissue. Of course, we know it's a rhythmic kind of tissue, uh, which is the result of pacemakers that exist in the heart. Um, the cardiac muscle works all the time. It's rhythmically contracting all the time, 24 hours a day. And again, it's involuntary, so thankfully you don't have to think about that. It's highly resistant to fatigue, as you might guess, since it, uh, a fatigued heart muscle would spell death uh, if it ever stopped contracting. So highly fatigue resistant and highly coordinated. Um, you don't see much in the way of summation, for instance, in cardiac muscle. Um, there's really no scenario in which you want it to contract just a tiny bit. Um, when, a muscle, when a heart contracts, you need it to contract and pump as much blood out as it can. And so it tends to act as a whole unit. You don't see much in the way of multiple motor unit summation. Um, and you also don't see temporal summation because if you think about it, there's really no scenario in which you want the heart to go into complete tetany and hold or sustain a contraction. Um, that essentially would also be counterproductive and again would cause uh, blood to stop pumping through the vessels and ultimately result in death. So the, all the cells of the heart tend to act in unison as, as a whole, and you don't see much in the way of the kinds of summation you see in skeletal muscle cells. Uh, the twitch duration is slow, um, and the contractions last fairly long relative to skeletal muscle cells. And this is because the contraction of the heart must last long enough to make sure we expel enough blood with each contraction. As I mentioned earlier, uh, cardiac muscle cells are lightly striated. Um, they, they do have sarcomeres and that creates the striations, but the sarcoplasmic reticulum isn't quite as extensive as in skeletal muscle cells and the T-tubules tend to be larger. Uh, perhaps the most important characteristic feature of cardiomyocytes are the 
uh, gap junctions, the electrical gap junctions. Uh, recall that gap junctions are types of cell junctions that allow direct movement of materials between uh, one cell and its neighbor. And so what this means is that um, action potentials, when they are created in a single cardiac muscle cell, will be able to um, transmit or move directly from one cell to another through these gap junctions. And again, if you go back to what an action potential actually is, remember each action potential is stationary and, and involves an injection of sodium ions into the cell. Well, because of gap junctions, the sodium ions that come in during the last action potential in one cell, those sodium ions can diffuse through the gap junction and depolarize the membrane of the neighboring cell uh, to threshold and thus create a new action potential in the neighboring cell, which then will begin to spread down that cell. And so just by virtue of allowing things to pass through directly, in this case specifically sodium ions, action potentials can pass directly from one cell to another. And also recall, since cardiomyocytes are bifurcates, since they are Y-shaped, a single cell can stimulate two neighboring cells. And then those two neighboring cells can stimulate uh, two each, so on to four, and then eight, 16, and so on. So you get this geometric spread of the action potential very quickly from cell to cell. So it's these gap junctions that allow the heart to function as a unit, as a whole. Because if you can just get some cells contracting, uh, generally speaking, the action potentials or the signals from those few cells will then spread directly throughout the entire wall of the heart. You don't need separate motor units and you don't need separate uh, axon terminals for each individual cell like you do for skeletal muscle tissue. All right, so this means that uh, you only have to get a few cells uh, contracting or electrically activated to get the whole heart going. And as it turns out, we have certain cells known as pacemaker cells that are actually able to generate that initial electrical activity that then spreads throughout the heart. And we'll talk about pacemakers in just a second. Um, in addition to gap junctions, of course, we also have some mechanical junctions, desmosomes, that keep the cardiac cells from pulling apart. Of course, you don't want your heart to pull apart during its contraction. And so uh, we don't just have gap junctions. We also have desmosomes that, that help hold them together tightly. Uh, as is the case with skeletal muscle tissue, damaged cardiac muscle tissue does not uh, replace itself. The muscle cells are incapable of, of cell division. Um, so if you damage a cell, uh, it can recover. But if you destroy a cell, um, it is not going to recover. And muscle cells are easier to um, kill than our skeletal muscle cells because they are almost uniquely dependent on aerobic respiration for their metabolism. If they are forced to go anaerobic, they do not survive for very long, just a matter of minutes. So um, dead cardiac cells are not replaced. Uh, instead, the tissue is replaced by fibrosis, which is a fancy word for scar, scarring, scar tissue. And of course, the more fibrosis that takes place in a muscle, be it a skeletal muscle or a cardiac muscle tissue, uh, you lose function because uh, scar tissue is primarily collagenous fibers, which are not contractile, not excitable. And so you, when you do replace lost muscle cells with scar tissue, you're losing strength and you're losing force. And if it becomes extensive enough, of course, the muscle can be begin to become dysfunctional. This is what happens in a heart attack when we uh, have a, uh, uh, we cut off the blood supply to a patch of muscle tissue. Cardiac muscle cells uh, served by that tiny blood vessel that's been blocked. Those muscle cells die and you lose function. And those cells are replaced by scar tissue and you never recover that muscle function. And with repeated heart attacks, the, the heart will just get weaker and weaker, and eventually you might succumb to heart failure. Of course, a, a massive heart attack will be a blockage in a major blood vessel, and you'll lose a very large portion of the heart muscle tissue all at once, uh, 
and that uh, that can result in a catastrophic heart failure and death. Now, as we said, because cardiac cells are connected through gap junctions, you don't have to independently stimulate each cell with an axon terminal as you do with skeletal muscle tissue. Instead, all you have to do is, again, get some cells contracting or electrically um, depolarizing, and that depolarization, those action potentials, will spread directly through the gap junctions. Well, some of these cardiac myocytes, again, are specialized and are known as pacemaker cells. And we learn much more about this in anatomy and physiology, too, when we talk about the cardiovascular system. But at any rate, um, these pacemaker cells are special types of cells that will spontaneously depolarize all by themselves. They don't need to be told by a neurotransmitter molecule to depolarize. They do it all by themselves in a rhythmic, uh, in a rhythmic sense. And so your heart actually has a variety of pacemaker patches of cells, pacemaker cells, and so it has a variety of pacemaker regions throughout. But there's only one pacemaker that sets the basic rhythm of the heart, and that is whichever pacemaker is the th is the one that depolarizes most frequently, the fastest pacemaker. Um, you may know this pacemaker as the SA node of the heart. Uh, this is the natural pacemaker of the heart, and it has an intrinsic rate of depolarization of about 100 to 120 depolarizations per minute. So again, it's just a patch of cells that all by themselves will depolarize 100 to 120 times a minute, creating literally 100 to 120 action potentials per minute that then automatically spread throughout the rest of the heart by gap junctions. Um, now, a couple of things may seem strange to you about this. First of all, you may think to yourself, well, at rest, sitting here right now as you read this or listen to this, your heart isn't beating at 100 to 120 beats per minute. Typical resting heart rate is about 70. So what's going on? How can I say that the SA node, these pacemaker cells of the SA node, depolarize 100 to 120 times per minute, and yet you're sitting there with a heart rate that's closer to 70? Well, this is a very interesting feature of the heart. The first thing to appreciate in regards to this is that the heart can contract without any stimulation from the central nervous system. The heart is what we call autorhythmic. It can contract independent of any nerve signals coming from the brain or spinal cord. So what this means is if I cut all nerve fibers serving the heart, it would not stop beating. That's, of course, very different from skeletal muscle cells. If I damage the spinal cord or damage nerves serving a muscle, a skeletal muscle, you will effectively paralyze that muscle. But with the heart, that's not true. If you damage or cut the nerves serving the heart, it does not stop. It will continue to beat. But what you'll notice if you did that experiment, which I don't recommend, but if you were to do it, what you would notice is when you do cut that those nerves that serve the heart, your heart rate at rest would immediately rise up to about 100 to 120 beats per minute, the intrinsic rate of depolarization of the natural pacemaker, the SA node. So what this does is this gives us a clue as to what the nerves that serve the heart do. Their function is not to tell the heart to contract, as it is with skeletal muscles. The function of the nerves that serve the heart is to adjust the heart rate. Not to create it, but to adjust it. In other words, to either make it faster or slower. And so at rest, what's happening is we have parasympathetic nerve fibers that are constantly telling the pacemaker cells of the SA node to slow down. Because you don't need a resting heart rate of 100 to 120 beats per minute. That creates blood flow and blood pressure that's in excess of what's required. And so the parasympathetic nervous system, which, by the way, is referred to as the resting and digesting system, it has the predominant effect on the heart while at rest, and its effect is to slow the heart down. It does this by releasing acetylcholine uh, onto the SA node, 
And in this particular case, acetylcholine, while it excites skeletal muscle, acetylcholine has a tendency to inhibit um, pacemaker cells of the SA node. Now, sometimes we do need our heart rate to speed up, again, such as during exercise. And during exercise, your heart rate can not only increase from 70 up to the intrinsic rate of about 100, but it can even exceed that. So in some cases of exercise, we might get a heart rate uh, upwards of 130, 140, 150 beats per minute or even more. To do that, we need to stimulate the pacemaker cells of the SA node with the other part of the autonomic nervous system, the sympathetic nervous system. And we do have a nerve that, that uh, sends sympathetic messages to the, to the heart, specifically to the SA node, um, and cause it to speed up. Uh, the reason the sympathetic nervous system causes the heart to speed up is because it releases a different kind of neurotransmitter onto the SA node. Uh, the sympathetic nervous system releases norepinephrine onto its effectors, onto its target cells. Norepinephrine has an excitatory effect on the SA node and causes it to speed up during a fight or flight response or exercise. And you may be aware that the sympathetic nervous system can be generally referred to as the fight or flight response. And of course, we know with a fight or flight response, we get an increase in the force and rate of uh, cardiac contraction. So to boil it down, we don't need any nerves for the heart to beat. It will beat all by itself. But to adjust the heart rate, we do need external innervation through the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous systems. Parasympathetic nervous system slows it down. Sympathetic nervous system speeds it up. Again, as I said earlier, um, the, the cardiac muscle tissue twitches very slowly relative to skeletal muscle. Um, and again, this gives the, the heart time to pump blood out of the ventricles, the chambers. And I also mentioned that it is very, very sensitive to uh, a deprivation of oxygen. It is exclusively aerobic in its metabolism. And so as you might expect, it has lots of myoglobin uh, to help as an oxygen reserve. And it has lots of very large mitochondria for this, uh, for this purpose. Okay. And so finally, for this chapter, we want to talk a little bit about smooth muscle tissue. Smooth muscle tissue, of course, as we remember from our histology discussion of muscle tissue, um, does not contain striations, which we now know means it does not contain organized sarcomeres, as does skeletal and cardiac muscle tissue. Um, some smooth muscle lacks, even lacks a nerve supply and is autorhythmic like cardiac muscle tissue. Uh, but most smooth muscle tissue does receive some innervation from, once again, the autonomic nervous system. And we'll see that the, uh, the way that we stimulate uh, smooth muscle fibers, again, is very different from how we do it with skeletal muscle tissue. Unlike cardiac and skeletal muscle tissue, smooth muscle cells are capable of mitosis. And so you can replace lost smooth muscle tissue with new cells. And, uh, and so injured smooth muscle tissue does regenerate well. Um, it does not form scar tissue that loses function. Uh, it, it replaces injured tissue with functional new muscle tissue. And finally, for this slide, smooth muscle tissue tends to be slower even than cardiac muscle tissue. Uh, because of the kinds of things that smooth muscle tissue does, it's not terribly important to have a fast twitch uh, that, that creates a quick contraction and then relaxation. So smooth muscle twitches can take um, seconds, up to seconds or even longer, to contract and relax. But that's because, again, of the kind of sluggish uh, activities that is usually performed. Now, there are some cases where smooth muscles contract very quickly, uh, but that's, that's the exception. 
the rule is fairly slow and sluggish response. So why do we see this um, slow and sluggish response? Well, again, it's because of the function that smooth muscle performs and primarily where it's located. Most of the smooth muscle in the body is in the walls of hollow organs. So where do we find it? We find it, for instance, in the wall of the esophagus, which propels food towards the stomach. We find it in the wall of the stomach and the intestines, which, which mix and churn food. We find it in the walls of blood vessels, uh, uh, causing constriction and dilation of those blood vessels, which alters blood flow. We find it in the walls of bronchioles and bronchi in the respiratory system, again, altering the diameter of bronchioles, especially altering airflow through the system. We find it in the walls of the urinary bladder and uterus, which again, uh, uh, contract in order to expel either urine or a fetus, a baby. So in all those cases, notice we're not really interested in, in quick uh, short-term contractions and we're not interested in rapid response. We're not interested in precise control. We're just interested in getting sort of a slow, uh, long-term kind of contraction that will change some kind of um, condition, either airflow, blood flow, contents of the digestive system, um, in a consistent, in a consistent way. So generally longer term, uh, kinds of contractions with less precise control. Now, as I did say, there are some exceptions to this. There are some cases of smooth muscle that do twitch relatively quickly and are under fairly precise control. But again, that's, that's rare. Um, some examples of this would be the iris of the eye. The iris is the colored part of your eye. It's actually a pigmented smooth muscle tissue. And of course, we um, contract and relax that muscle to change the size of the pupil, which controls how much light is allowed into the eye. The pupil is the, the black spot of the eye. It's actually not a structure. It's a hole. It's an opening. And it's the opening that allows light into the eyeball uh, to fall upon the retina so that you can generate an image and send it to the brain. Um, we need to control that pupil size. So in bright light, we need to make the pupil very small so we don't overexpose the retina. In dark light, we need to make the pupil very large uh, to maximize how much light we're letting in. And that change in pupil diameter happens relatively quickly and, and precisely. Also, the, remember piloerector muscles that cause goosebumps in the skin, uh, they also respond fairly quickly and precisely to their stimuli. So there are, there are some exceptions, but mostly smooth muscle uh, performs sluggishly. And here we see a diagram of uh, smooth muscle, for instance, in the wall of the stomach. Most of the smooth muscle is in a layer here called the muscularis externa. Um, you also have a thin layer close to the inner surface, but again, it's just distributed usually in the walls of the organs. Remember that smooth muscle cells are fusiform in shape, which means they taper to a point at each end. Uh, there's a single nucleus uh, in each cell. And we do have thick and thin filaments, as it, is this the case with the other tissues, but again, they're not arranged in... Uh, sarcomeres, and so we don't see the characteristic striations. There is not much sarcoplastic reticulum, and there are no T tubules. So that right away tells you that the mechanism of contraction is going to be a little bit different. We're still going to have sliding filaments. We're still going to have thick and thin filaments sliding across each other, but the pattern, the way in which they do it, is going to be uh, very different from the other two tissue types. Uh, we still do use calcium for muscle contraction, still required, but because there's very little sarcoplasmic reticulum, the calcium for the contraction does not come from inside the cell. The majority of the calcium that triggers contraction is coming from outside the muscle cell, from the extracellular fluid. That's what ECF stands for here, extracellular fluid. 
The calcium comes from outside the cell and passes into the cell through calcium channels in the sarcolemma, the cell membrane. Again, we have no sarcomeres, so we do not have Z-discs in smooth muscle cells. We do have a type of protein plaque, though, known as dense bodies. Dense bodies can be thought of as, in essence, little discs of protein, and they are arranged throughout the cell. The dent, some dense bodies uh, are on the inner face of the sarcolemma. So some of the dense bodies are actually attached to the inner surface of the cell's membrane. And at that point, they're referred to as plaques, protein plaques. Other dense bodies, other dense body discs, are scattered throughout the sarcoplasm. All the dense bodies within the cell, as we'll see in a second, are linked together. And even the plaques, the, the dense bodies that are at the surface, uh, underneath the surface of the membrane, the plaques of one cell are linked to the plaques of neighboring cells. And so smooth muscle cells tend to be physically connected to each other by linking their plaques together. This is what smooth muscle looks like under the microscope. Uh, again, you can't see any of that detail that we just talked about, dense bodies, plaques, things like that. They're all um, submicroscopic. Those are, exist at the molecular level. A close-up view, uh, what this primarily shows is the spindle-shaped structure of smooth muscle cells. Again, uh, long and tapering to a point at each tip with a single centrally located nucleus. Now, smooth muscle tissue comes in two types and really is quite different in terms of how it's controlled. The first type we're going to talk about is called multi-unit multi -unit smooth muscle tissue. Multi-unit smooth muscle tissue is the, the less common of the two types of tissues. It occurs only in a few places, some of the large arteries of the body, uh, so the air passages, the erector pili muscles or piloerector muscles, again, causing goosebumps, and the iris of the eye. And so what you may note about this is that, uh, especially with those last two locations, this is the kind of muscle tissue that is capable of more precise um, control, more precise contraction. Um, in terms of how it's controlled, it receives, again, autonomic innervation, sympathetic and parasympathetic, but it receives its signals in the forms of motor units, conventional motor units. So as is the case with skeletal muscle cells, you have terminal branches of an axon, an autonomic axon, and that those branch, a uh, single axon will branch repeatedly and synapse with individual cells. So each individual cell gets its own nerve ending, very much as was the case with skeletal muscle tissue. And so, of course, each motor unit, the cells of each motor unit will contract together as a unit, and they will contract separately from the cells of other motor units. So this is very reminiscent of the innervation of skeletal muscle cells, and this is what gives us the fine control. And as is the case with skeletal muscle tissue, we, we start by stimulating the smallest motor units, and then we progress to larger and larger motor units if we need more strength. And this is how we have the precise control. But again, this is, this is not the most common type of skeletal muscle tissue. This is, this is less common. By far, the more common type of skeletal muscle, I'm sorry, smooth muscle tissue is called the single unit smooth muscle tissue. <clears throat> this is the kind of uh, smooth muscle, of course, that's found everywhere else, uh, essentially in the walls of all those organs I talked about earlier, the blood, uh, most blood vessels, digestive, respiratory uh, tubes, um, urinary system, uh, like the bladder and ureters, reproductive tract, uh, including the uterus and so on. Uh, some people will refer to this as visceral muscle. Um, but we're going to use single unit smooth muscle to con remember the contrast with, uh, with multi-unit um, smooth muscle.
What's interesting about single unit smooth muscle is that they're somewhat reminiscent of cardiac muscle cells in that the cells are electrically connected to each other by gap junctions. So as was the case with cardiac muscle tissue in single unit smooth muscle tissue, you do not have a separate axon terminal for each cell. Instead, you have the stimulation of just a few cells and then the action potentials will spread by gap junctions in a cell-to-cell -cell fashion. And so you generally get the contraction of large numbers of cells as, as one because, of, because they're all electrically connected. And when one or a few are stimulated, eventually the rest are stimulated. So taking a look at what happens in single unit smooth muscle, you have again a autonomic axon uh, approaching the smooth muscle tissue. It will, it will separate, but notice it doesn't have uh, terminals with synaptic uh, terminals or boutons. Instead, along the way, it has the, the axon has little bulges in it, and these are known as varicosities. And these varicosities function like axon terminals would in a somatic motor neuron. And so what we mean by that is that as action potentials spread down the axon and the branches, as they pass by, as action potentials pass by each varicosity, that will stimulate the varicosity to release its neurotransmitter. And so instead of having a very specific neuromuscular junction, one specific site, what we tend to get is a flood of neurotransmitter related, released from the varicosities and spreading pretty generally over the surface of the muscle tissue. And so you're going to get simultaneous stimulation of multiple smooth muscle cells uh, from all these varicosities releasing their neurotransmitter into the, into the space around the muscle cells. This is what's going to initiate muscle contraction in at least some of these cells. And then, because of gap junctions, the action potentials in a contracting cell will be able to spread to its neighbors, and so on and so on and so forth. So this is a very unique way of stimulating contraction that we see in just single unit smooth muscle tissue. Different from skeletal muscle tissue and different from cardiac muscle tissue. And so here again, we see the contrast between what we were just looking at, the single unit with all the varicosities and then gap junctions connecting the cells versus a multi-unit smooth muscle where you have a single axon that branches and stimulates uh, individual cells one at a time, again, through varicosities, uh, but we do not have gap junctions spreading the signal from cell to cell. Instead, each cell that receives uh, a stimulus from a single axon will function as a unit, as a motor unit. And so these cells in this particular case are going to contract, but not these cells back here. They're not part of that motor unit. In this particular case, all these cells will contract and given enough time, gap junctions will continue to spread the signal. And even these cells back here will generally start to contract through their electrical connection of gap junctions. All right, so how do we get contraction going in smooth muscles? Again, it's very different. It's very different from um, what we see in skeletal muscle tissue. Um, the first thing to appreciate is that there's actually several ways to get smooth muscle tissue to contract. If they don't just solely respond necessarily to neurotransmitters uh, at a synapse. Um, but that certainly is one way we can get them to begin contracting. Um, we can release neurotransmitters and those neurotransmitters again are different depending on which part of the autonomic nervous system is stimulating them. As I said earlier, the parasympathetic nervous system tends to deliver acetylcholine to its target. The sympathetic nervous system tends to release norepinephrine onto its target. And so because we have different neurotransmitters, as you might guess, you tend to have different effects between these two systems. Um, now, there's a tendency to think of the parasympathetic nervous system as always inhibiting its target, uh, 
and the sympathetic nervous system is always stimulating its target. And that's, un that's unfortunate because it's not true, but this whole fight or flight response thing gets us to th thinking excitatory and resting, digesting gets us thinking inhibitory. The reality is that, um, as is usual in AMP, the situation is not that straightforward. The parasympathetic nervous system releasing acetylcholine can either excite or relax smooth muscle depending on its location. And the same is true for the sympathetic nervous system. The norepinephrine that it releases can either excite or relax smooth muscle depending on location. So you really can't say that one or the other excites or relaxes. Um, they do both. Each does both depending again on location. Now, at this point, you may be scratching your head and saying, well, if the parasympathetic nervous system always releases acetylcholine, how can it excite some smooth muscle cells and relax others? Well, the answer is that it depends on the kind of receptors that you have for acetylcholine. In skeletal muscle, of course, we saw that we had acetylcholine receptors and they were always excitatory. But there are other kinds of acetylcholine receptor molecules that can be inhibited by acetylcholine. Generally speaking, there's a whole class of receptors for acetylcholine called cholinergic receptors. Some of them are, are um, what we call nicotinic receptors. Some are called muscarinic receptors. I don't want to get too in detail because uh, time permitting, we'll talk about this when we get to the autonomic nervous system. But the fact that there are different receptors means that acetylcholine can have different effects on its target, depending on which receptor molecule is present in the smooth muscle cells in that location. So this is how acetylcholine can stimulate some smooth muscle cells and inhibit others. It really depends on the type of receptor that they have. Uh, and the same is true for norepinephrine coming out of the sympathetic nervous system. The receptors for norepinephrine are called adrenergic receptors. And again, there are different types. There's alpha adrenergic and beta adrenergic receptors. And even within those categories, there's alpha 1, alpha 2, beta 1, beta 2. Um, the take home message is again that there's a variety of receptors and these different receptors can respond differently to norepinephrine, some being excited, some being inhibited. And so once again, we see the sympathetic nervous system can excite some types of smooth muscle, but inhibit others. So the example they gave here for the sympathetic nervous system was that it relaxed smooth muscle in the bronchioles, which causes dilation. But the effect of norepinephrine on say the smooth muscle in the walls of most blood vessels is excitatory and it tends to cause uh, vasoconstriction which increases blood pressure throughout the system which is what you want during a fight or flight system. So again the same the same neurotransmitter with opposite effects on different locations in the body. And similarly we can you uh, talk about excitatory and inhibitory examples of the parasympathetic system and acetylcholine. Acetylcholine from the parasympathetic nervous system, for instance, stimulates muscle, smooth muscle contraction in your digestive system. It is, after all, called the resting and digesting system. And so we see it stimulates um, smooth muscle contraction there. But in other parts of the body, it causes uh, inhibition. For instance, in many of the um, uh, smooth muscles in the um, of the um, res I'm sorry in the respiratory system it also causes tends to cause stimulation and constriction uh, but in other places it causes uh, relaxation so um, again all depends on the type of receptors you have for the neurotransmitter but as we said at the start of this slide nerve stimulation is not the only way to get smooth muscle cells excited uh, you can excite them with various other chemicals besides neurotransmitters. So there are some hormones, for instance, that can stimulate smooth muscle contraction. The best known one is oxytocin. The synthetic version is known as pitocin. Uh, this hormone stimulates uterine contractions. And of course, pitocin is used to speed along uh, labor and delivery. And I mentioned pitocin earlier um, in my lab discussion of the brain. And so for students in my lab, you, you may recognize oxytocin. 
uh, carbon dioxide, oxygen, pH. Uh, these are all uh, can, uh, chemicals that can directly stimulate smooth muscle contraction. And when we get to A and P2, we'll see that there is a certain rationale for why these three things in particular have an effect on smooth muscle contraction, especially in blood vessels. Uh, but it's a little bit too complicated to go into right now. But uh, if this will make sense when we get to A and P2. Temperature can affect um, smooth muscle cells and excite or uh, inhibit them. Uh, for instance, cold will excite your erector pili muscles or piloerector muscles causing goosebumps. Of course, when it gets warm, that tends to then inhibit those mus that smooth muscle. Stretch has a tendency to stimulate smooth muscle tissue. Um, so as you stretch them out, they tend to contract uh, in response. Um, but there's a qualifier to this that we'll see in just a few minutes. Uh, the, usually the contraction response is very, very short-lived and is followed up by a reflexive relaxation following stretch. And this makes a certain amount of sense, right? Because as your stomach is stretched, as it receives food, if all it did was contract, then it would contract and push the food right back up. And you would essentially vomit every time you ate. Instead, what happens is it contracts initially and for a very brief period of time, but then it reflexively starts to relax so that it can expand to accept more and more food without uh, causing you to regurgitate it. So stretch has an initial stim acts as an initial stimulus, but then eventually it ends up causing relaxation. And then finally, uh, some smooth muscle tissue, like cardiac pacemaker cells, are autorhythmic. And so there are literally pacemaker cells in some parts of the body, most notably your stomach. The lining of your stomach contains pacemaker cells that will generate stomach contractions at regular intervals, usually something like three contractions per minute. Um, most of the time, these pacemaker cells generate sub-threshold level depolarization, so you don't actually notice the stomach contracting. But if those pacemaker cells are ignited by certain stimuli like caffeine or protein uh, in the stomach, then that will strengthen those depolarizations and you will actually experience the, the rhythmic stomach contractions. So uh, unlike skeletal muscle, again, a variety of different ways we can get the muscle to begin contraction. All right, as we said, uh, contraction is a little bit different than in skeletal muscle cells. It is similar in that it's triggered by calcium. It is similar in that you need ATP to supply the energy, and it is similar in that you uh, achieve the contraction by sliding thick and thin filaments across one another. But in almost every other aspect, the contraction of smooth muscle is very different. So as we mentioned already, uh, most of the calcium comes from outside the cell. And so what happens is when they are stimulated by whatever stimulus we just talked about, chemicals, stretch, uh, autonomic nervous system. When when the smooth muscle cell is stimulated, calcium channels in the sar in the sarcomere, the sarco uh, lemma, excuse me, the cell membrane, open, and this allows calcium to flood into the cell. Uh, these gated calcium channels are located in depressions in the sarcolemma called cavioli. At any rate, um, we have different calcium channels that are designed to respond to different stimuli, right? So some calcium channels respond to stretch, some respond to oxygen or pH changes, some respond to voltage, some respond to neurotransmitters, uh, etc. So again, different kinds of gates for different for all the different stimuli that can stimulate the smooth muscle cell. All right, so once the calcium enters the cell, it uh, doesn't bind to troponin. There is no troponin to bind to, as was the case with skeletal muscle tissue. Instead, it binds to a molecule called calmodulin, which is located on the thick filaments. The binding of calcium to calmodulin then activates some enzymes in the myosin, and that activation of the myosin head causes the myosin head to begin breaking down ATP. So to make a long story short, the calcium binds to calmodulin on the thick filament. 
The calmodulin causes some enzymatic changes in the myosin, which allows it to start utilizing ATP. Once the myosin head starts utilizing ATP, it undergoes the typical power stroke sequence that we saw in skeletal muscles. The myosin head goes through a power stroke, releases the uh, ADP and inorganic phosphate, releases from the myosin head, grabs a new ATP, resets, uh, hydrolyzes the ATP for power as it resets to its high energy configura configuration, goes through another power stroke, and so on and so forth. So the power stroking mechanism is essentially the same as for skeletal muscle. So the thick filaments pull on the thin filaments. The thin filaments, of course, are connected to all the dense bodies. Remember we said the dense bodies are all connected to each other. Well, they're connected through the thin filaments. And so the power stroking pulls on the thin filaments, which pulls on the dense bodies, pulling them closer to each other. And of course, remember the dense bodies are also connected to the membranous plaques. And so the entire muscle cell shortens as the dense bodies are pulled and the plaques are pulled closer together. Of course, because the plaques are attached to the membrane, again, the membrane shortens. And also because, remember, the plaques are connected to the plaques of other cells, the contraction of one cell can also assist in the contraction of neighboring cells. And as the muscle cell shortens, it tends to spiral and pucker and take on a, a very interesting shape. Unlike skeletal muscle cells, uh, skeletal muscle cells pretty much maintain their cylindrical shape. They just get shorter. But smooth muscle cells tend to twist and, and pucker out uh, between the thin filaments. Little bits of cytoplasm and sarcomere are puckering out. And so you get a very strange configuration that looks like this. So here we see two two smooth muscle cells uh, relaxed. Here you see the thick filaments shown in dark purple and they are again connected to the thin filaments through cross bridges potentially. Um, the plaques are these little nodules here, these little spots, and the plaques are these lighter colored discs which are basically just the dense bodies that are attached to the cell membrane. Um, notice that the dense bodies are connected to the um, uh, thick filaments through the thin filaments. And we also have protein uh, filaments that connect all the dense bodies and plaques to each other. And so during contraction, you get cross bridge formation, and these little myosin molecules are going to perform their power strokes, pulling on the thin filaments in opposite directions. And that's going to tend to pull all the dense bodies and plaques closer together. And again, remember the plaques of neighboring cells tend to be anchored to each other, so they, the two cells will tend to pull on each other as well. And so this cell is going to shorten and this cell is going to shorten, but notice the puckered appearance. So they kind of lose their spindle shape and as the dense bodies get pulled closer and closer together, the two cells pull on each other through their connected plaques. And these sarcoplasm and sarcomere tend to pucker out between the protein filaments that hold the dense bodies together. And what's not shown as well here is that they also tend to twist. I think the twisting perhaps is revealed by the shape of the nucleus here, which tends to become spiraled um, as, the, as the muscle cell contracts. So it spirals and puckers, and that's what, uh, what they look like as they shorten. So very interesting change in conformation. As we said earlier, the contraction of smooth muscle is very slow compared to skeletal muscle. Um, and here's some numbers for you. The latent period is 50 to 100 milliseconds, almost a tenth of a second just for the latent period, which is the, remember, the time between stimulation and actual contraction. Uh, that was only about two milliseconds in skeletal muscle cells. Um, tension tends to peak at around half a second. And again, in most skeletal muscle cells, tension will peak within 50 to 100 milliseconds. And uh, the relaxation phase can last up to several seconds. So it's, as we said, a very sluggish, slow kind of contraction that these cells go through. And again, this is mostly because of slow enzymes and slow calcium pumps uh, that are involved in the process.
There is also something called a latch bridge mechanism that helps make this muscle tissue resistant to fatigue. Um, we do have muscle tone in um, smooth muscle, just like in skeletal muscle cell. We can have um, tetany and sustained contraction. And this is what we call vasomotor tone or intestinal tone. In most cases, the smooth muscle tissue never relaxes completely. But we don't use the conventional uh, temporal summation to cause tetany. Because again, we generally don't have motor units and, 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 and don't have high frequency stimulation that would cause tetany. Instead, what happens is that it's, there's a mechanism called the latch bridge mechanism that when myosin heads get to the end of a power stroke, um, they can hold on to the actin filaments and just stop consuming ATP. This is almost a rigor mortis-like state, if you think about it. Remember, rigor mortis occurs when, you, in a skeletal muscle, you completely run out of ATP and the myosin head can't let go of the actin filament, and so you, you get a state of stiffness. Well, in smooth muscle, this can be done um, on purpose, and you can get a myosin head finishing its power stroke and then not picking up any fresh ATP, even if ATP is present. And so it will simply hold on to the thin filament and not let go. This is referred to as a latch bridge. And so in, this is how smooth muscle can maintain a state of contraction without actually utilizing any ATP. All right. And so this latch bridge mechanism allows uh, smooth muscle tone to be maintained almost indefinitely, pretty much perpetually, with no fatigue because it's the latch bridge mechanism maintaining the contraction, not, um, not an actual contraction mechanism that's consuming ATP. So that's also another very interesting feature of smooth muscle tissue. As we said earlier, stretch will tend to stimulate the uh, muscle initially, uh, but in certain organs, we don't want that stretch to perpetually cause contraction because that would would um, result in some inconvenient responses like regurgitation when you eat or almost instant urination as the as the bladder fills with urine. And so in some organs like the stomach and the bladder, we have what's called the stress relaxation response. Um, and this again is specifically in organs that need to be able to expand or fill without without contracting. In other smooth muscle, we just have the, the contraction response. And so in, say, something like the small intestine, as it fills with food and uh, starts to get stretched out, it will experience contraction. And this results in waves of contraction known as peristalsis. And this is what helps to continue to propel the food through the intestine as we progressively digest it as it moves along. We uh, saw in skeletal muscle that there is a length tension relationship uh, where if the skeletal muscle is too long or too short, it loses its ability to generate tension. Uh, we do not see that here in smooth muscle tissue. Because the thick filaments are free to um, migrate along the thin filaments, they're not hooked up to any Z disks, uh, they can essentially generate tension, form cross bridges perpetually, regardless of how long or how short the, the muscle fiber is. It just continues to crawl along those um, thin filaments that are attached to the dense bodies. So this is what allows smooth muscle to be greatly stretched and still maintain its ability to contract. <clears throat> and again, this is important in certain organs like the stomach and the bladder because sooner or later we do want them to be able to contract to expel their contents. Um, and, you know, they're capable of quite a bit of stretch uh, to, especially the bladder, to hold up to one and a half liters of urine potentially, um, though that's, that's extreme, but it potentially can hold that much. And... Um, course being that stretched out it still needs to have its ability to contract otherwise you would not be able to urinate and so this plasticity this this ability to be stretched 
and still have uh, an ability to contract even though it's stretched is an important characteristic of smooth muscle tissue. All right, so again, um, smooth muscle can be stretched as we just finished talking about. And as we said, the reasons are that there are no Z discs to bump into. Um, there's no organized sarcomere, so the thick filaments can crawl along the thin filaments almost the entire length of the muscle cell. And, uh, and that's, that's pretty much, as I mentioned already, the reason why we see this. All right, and I think that's um, this particular chapter. We're not going to talk about uh, muscular dystrophy or myasthenia gravis. They're interesting. I encourage you to read up on them um, if you're interested, but they, we are not going to hold ourselves responsible for that for this class. So we are done with chapter 11, the muscles, and we are ready to start a new chapter and a new system, the nervous system. And so next time when we get together, I will be starting our discussion of chapter 12, uh, the introduction to the nervous system. Until then, uh, have a good weekend if, uh, if the weekend is coming, which it is, and we'll see you next time.